Great, I see the numbers are ticking up there in the room, so I will kick us off. Hello and welcome to today's webinar on livestock methane, the use and misuse of GWP star. I'm Hazel Healy, the UK editor at the investigations outlet DSmog, where we cover food politics and climate stories. And I, as an editor, have personally grappled with GWP star, so I'm really excited to see such a high level of interest today. For those of you who are new to the term, GWP star is a new way to measure the global warming potential of the greenhouse gas methane. And we're here to discuss it today because it's proving controversial. Bloomberg Green has called it the beef industry's fuzzy methane maths, and leading scientists have questioned the ways in which it's being used by industry. So to help us understand this better, we are lucky enough to have a fantastic panel joining us today. They are Nusha Banachit from uh, the Changing Markets, the CEO of Changing Markets, which is a nonprofit that works to shift markets towards solutions that benefit the environment and society and the organizers of today's panel. We also have Nick Carter, who's an ecologist at the plantbaseddata.org and Donald Murphy Bokern, who's an independent agricultural scientist and last but not least, Ngoni Chirinda, a professor at Mohammed VI Polytechnic University in Morocco. I'm going to run through some questions for the panel and there'll be time uh, for questions from the audience at the end. So do put those in the chat as we go. My first question uh, is for Nick. We've seen that methane emissions from livestock are coming under growing scrutiny, most recently at COP. 28 in Dubai. Can you talk to us about why this is an important topic that's coming under such scrutiny now? Yeah, thank you. And, and hi, everyone. Um, so methane is our emergency break for the climate crisis. You know, cutting these emissions now is crucial to avoid tipping points like ice sheet collapses and permafrost thaw. And food is the biggest share of human caused methane at about 40%. And the vast majority of that, uh, making about 32% of all human-caused methane, comes from animal agriculture, mostly uh, belches from ruminants like cattle, but also mass amounts of, of manure. Now, how much does this kind of cause to, you know, net warming to date? I mean, it's, it's about 0.5 degrees Celsius of the approximate 1.1 degrees of uh, global warming that we've seen since industrialization. And I think important for this conversation in this webinar is over the next 20 years, uh, it's especially important for you know, our climate efforts. And during this time, uh, methane is predicted to warm the planet almost as much as CO2. And this is why you know, the IPCC, the latest uh, AR6 report, uh, working groups one and two, they recommend strong, uh, sustained, and um, rapid reductions in methane. And of course, there's the Global Methane Pledge signed by 150 countries that have pledged uh, pretty major reductions in methane uh, by 2030. And if I kind of zoom in a bit on, uh, you know, the 4 billion firm ruminants we have in the world, uh, the latest IPCC report also shows that, and I quote here, increasing numbers is directly linked with increasing CH4 emissions, continued global livestock population growth between 1990 in 2019, including increases of 18% in cattle and buffalo numbers, 30% in sheep and goat numbers, uh, corresponds with CH4 emission trend increases. And so this kind of brings us to like the, the current tactics that we're seeing now. Um, you know, if you look up methane and flow gas, you get a highly industry funded blog from the Clear Center uh, at UC Davis. And what they ignore in, in the term flow gas is that flow typically refers to a substances that are kind of emitted and removed from the atmosphere relatively quickly, thus having a, a more immediate but kind of transient um, impact where, um, you know, methane still lasts in the atmosphere about 12 years. And critically, there's a significant stock and it is going up. So accepting current levels as a current baseline, and I can't really stress that enough because that is relevant to what we're talking about today with GWP STAR, you know, accepting this current baseline is not accurate. Uh, I mean, we need far less. So, I mean, if you look at methane 
uh, from pre-industrial levels to now, we're 262% uh, above in concentration levels um, in the atmosphere. So, and then kind of related to this uh, claim as well is like an accompanying claim that uh, methane from cows is different and it's perfectly cyclical. Um, but ultimately, like the atmosphere doesn't care whether methane comes from a, a cow or fracking or waste. Uh, this is ultimately misinformation. The, the slight variance in methane from sources is pretty much in, insignificant to the, the grand scheme of things. And, um, you know, so why does this kind of technical aspect all matter? Well, we're trying to we're trying to convert kind of greenhouse gases into a metric called CO2 E, uh, CO2 equivalent. And it's not a perfect science, but um, it's what the Paris Agreement was uh, set at. And it does a good job of, of both holding emitters accountable um, and can measure uh, warming well when used appropriately, like we showed in our report, uh, figure seven in box one. Uh, so ultimately, GWP star, this is where that comes in. Uh, it's a new tactic to measure changes in warming um, over time and accepts this high baseline and rewards the biggest current emitters as if we we're all starting at ground zero. So a feedlot of say 100,000 um, cattle, which is common in the United States, uh, could be significantly rewarded, say to shifting to 90,000 cattle. But that's not an accurate representation of what we need to do for methane. And I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Yeah, I was actually at in Dubai myself, uh, listening to some of the panelists in the food and climate pavilion and to hear certain representatives who are closely linked to the beef industry you would have thought they were like solving the problem of uh climate change rather than contributing to it so that the metric is you know definitely in circulation and it does feel as if the industry is jumping at the chance to kind of showcase what they what they do and their kind of efforts to tackle climate change in in perhaps what might could be described as a misleading way I'm going to turn now to Donald because you co-authored a paper with Casper Doninson about the livestock industry and how it's using the metric GWP star to say that it can become climate neutral with just minimal reductions in methane. Can, can you unpick this idea for us a bit? Yes, well, um, I, I'll pick up on Nick's uh, uh, contribution. Uh, thank you, Hazel. And... Uh, I remind us that GWP 100 is a starting point. It measures the effect of a basket of, of, of gases, short and long-term gases, on climate over the following 100 years. It's a climate change metric. Now, I'll be, I'll be blunt about this. GWP star is not a global warming potential metric. And there are scientists who agree, senior scientists who agree with me on that one. It is something. It, it it focuses on the change in warming as affected by the changes in emissions, ignoring the level of warming that has already taken place. Um, the star gives the impression that it's an improved version of GW100. It's not an improved version of GW100. It's it's something different. It's a modeling tool that com com can complement GW100. Now, to understand the consequences, let's make an analogy. I know analogies are sometimes risky, but let's imagine three cars traveling along a motorway in Germany. The first car has just arrived on the motorway and is, is traveling at 50. The motorway has a speed limit of 100 kilometers per hour. The, the first car is traveling at 50 kilometers an hour, but accelerating up to 60. The second car is cruising along at exactly the speed limit, 100. And the third car is racing ahead at 150. The average, average speed of those three cars is 100, the speed limit. If you take the analogy of GWB 100, you would, you would measure the speed of those cars and you would find that one car was breaking the speed limit, the, the fastest one, obviously. If you switch your metric, and your speed uh, camera to acceleration, change in speed, the car that is doing 50 gets the punishment. So th this change in metric is vitally important to understand. And it is about a, ch a metric which uh, analyzes changes in a st changing state, not the state itself. 
And uh, so imagine the chaos we would have if uh, speed cameras were measuring acceleration and deceleration rather than speed. And that's what we're faced with, with a shift, uh, a wholesale shift to GWP 100. Um, it's really shocking in my opinion, to hear academic advocates imply that GWP star is an alternative to GWP 100 and that GWP 100 gives the wrong answer, inverted commas, the wrong answer, misleading carbon footprint results and is not fit for purpose. I'm quoting directly from a, a leading advocate of GWP star. This is wrong. Uh, and they're doing this in very sensitive stakeholder communities. They're doing it in amongst industrial partner uh, uh, communities that will respond to this rhetoric. And at the same time, they're retreating back to their academic uh, castles uh, when challenged by these, this rhetoric. They retreat and say, we're only scientists. We, 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 we're not responsible for the consequences of the use of the tool, which in itself is correct. So I'll, I, I, I'll leave it up with, at that on the point about uh, um, GWP uh, star. Now, if you want to, you, uh, are you interested, should we go into the climate neutrality claim, which is the other aspect of our paper? Um, climate neutrality is a phrase that was, that was uh, coined by policymakers to describe a situation where the uh, emission of greenhouse gases and the removal of those gases in, are in balance. A, a, a term coined to communicate with a broad stakeholder audience and voters. Fair enough. This definition or this uh, understanding of that phrase was subtly changed to mean um, to no change to no further warming. Let's ignore the level of warming we already have. Let's ignore the level of greenhouse gases that we already have, and let's focus on whether the change in the, the warming, the, the, the warming is changing itself. And uh, they uh, have coined, used this phrase climate neutrality to describe a situation measured or assessed using GWP star where uh, temporarily um, the, no further warming is happening in relation to a particular business entity, country, or whatever. So the end result of all of that is that Article 2 of Paris, which is the goal of Paris, which is to stabilize climate, is being traded off against Article 4. And the fairness aspect of Article 4 is being thrown out the window. The, you know, the equity, fairness, sustainable development aspects. And words are being very carefully chosen. If you analyze the statements from people advocating on behalf of industry, uh, this change, uh, the words are being very that they're using are being very carefully chosen. And what's even being more carefully chosen is the words they are not using. And what you know, I notice in statements recently is that they describe uh, GWP star as me measuring, let's say measuring warming. What they forget to say, it is measuring additional warming or further warming. It's not measuring warming. And so it gets people like the car traveling at 150 off the hook. And this is why um, there's been a, uh, a pile in to, to this area to convince the world policy community, global policy community to abandon, according to some of these statements, abandon GWP 100 stop measuring warming and instead just measure the change in warming. In relation to um, Article 2, logical enough, but the consequences are profound. So I can, um, Alma, if you like, you can, we can start uh, just, uh, I'll end by showing the, 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 the uh, yeah, this is the, the cover of our paper. Our climate neutrality claims in the livestock sector too good to be true? The answer is yes, of course. Uh, we, we analyzed six papers uh, and each, each of these six papers claimed that the livestock industry in, in countries where livestock are, have a major, are a major part of the agricultural economy, such as the United States, 
and Australia, uh, they're using GWP star to show that these sectors will be climate neutral in the next few decades, despite being continuing to be emitters of significant quantities, very large quantities of greenhouse gases. And so how do they do this? Um, they you see on the top uh, line, you see a constant level of carbon dioxide and constant level of methane. Moving over to the right, you see the warming effect of that. If you move down, if you see a step change in emissions, step reduction in methane emissions, what you get is a temporary reduction in warming caused by the methane, which offsets, cancels out the effect of the ongoing carbon dioxide emissions with the result that there is a temporary uh, temporary reduction in, in, greenhouse, in the greenhouse effect uh, arising from those activities. What those papers, I was able to follow those papers mo most of the way to the end and agree with them. What, what made them un come unstuck for me was they did not, they emphasized that methane is a temporary gas, a flow gas as Nicholas described it, uh, uh, but failed to acknowledge that while it, because it is a temporary gas, the effect of its reduction is also temporary. So um, yeah, and you can see this in, in one of the papers which describes uh, the effect of the of the, Amer the United States dairy industry on global warming using GWP-100 and GWP-STAR. And you see that uh, using GWP-100, uh, you, you, you see the rising, uh, uh, the rising level of, of warming arising from the uh, activities. Um, uh, using GWP-STAR, there is a peaking of warming and at that, at some point, due to the very small reductions in methane, there is a claim that warming uh, levels out and, and, and declines, and there is no additional warming. And this is claimed to be climate neutrality, even though that activity is continuing to emit large amounts of greenhouse gases. So that's, uh, that's my, uh, where we got to in our paper. Um, uh, it was received very well. Uh, it has been downloaded several thousand times. Um, the uh, makers of GWP star um, came out quickly and said, GWP star should never be used or should not be used on its own. It should always be used as a supplement to GWP 100. At the same time, some of these people say that GWP 100 is seriously flawed. So. There is contradictions even amongst the people themselves. And these contradictions, I believe, are driven by the, uh, by the uh, interests of, of uh, the big emitters. Thanks, Donald, for going into the technical side of the metric. Um, it's fair to summarise that whether it was planned in this way or not, using GWP star, particularly in isolation, has the effect of penalizing new and growing sources of yes. methane. And so it's possible to be a, a, very, a highly polluting uh, beef or lamb producer who could, under a GWP star metric, uh, not have to do very much. But under the previous to that, they, they would have. So there's already like a question there about um, the ways in which this is being used, which which weren't necessarily, you know, how it was envisaged. So I would like to turn now to Nusa, Nusha, sorry. Uh, we've been hearing about this uh, tool, you know, it's been described as greenwashing. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? That's something that Changing Markets has looked into and articulated. And can you tell us uh, how you see this affecting climate data? climate action and what big companies are doing to kind of address their high methane emissions. Yes, that's great. So I'll base this on the Sing Stars report that we co-wrote with Nicholas Carter. And I want to show you some slides because I think it's easier to to kind of um yeah see what is the problem with um with meth calculating methane emissions for companies and countries using this new metric GWP star. 
So uh, Alma, I don't know if you can put on slides. Um, and yeah, so this is uh, what we did for this report. We calculated 30% reduction of emissions and methane emissions for one meat company, Tyson, and one dairy company, Fonterra. As many of you know, meat and dairy companies are not very transparent when it comes to their emissions. And um, in order to be able to do these calculations, we had to rely on estimates that we did previously together with the Institute for Agriculture Trade, Pol and Trade Policy, which, is, um, which was launched in November 2022. And this was based on the FAO GLIM model, which enables us to break down different sources of emissions into nitrous oxide, CO2, and methane. And we use those estimates as a baseline, and we calculated 15 and 30% emissions reductions. So here you can see 30% reduction, which is kind of in line with the Global Methane Pledge. And we also have one dairy company, Danone, that committed to 30% reduction by 2030 in January last year. Uh, so it is a realistic expectation for these companies to reduce their emissions by so much. And, um, and in yellow, you can see total emissions calculated with GWP 100, both for Tyson and for Fonterra. And in the case for Tyson, these emissions would be around annual emissions of Peru, and for Fonterra, annual emissions of Sri Lanka. So despite the reductions, the emissions are still significant. But if you change the metric, you get a significant negative emissions, which you see in orange columns. So when you add up non-methane emissions, you still end up with a hugely negative um, result. And this is kind of in line to what proponents of GWP STAR are saying, like companies could get could become climate neutral by annual reductions in the range of 1.5%, which is less than 30% a year, 30% per decade, which is what we calculated here. Um, if you move to the next slide, then you can see what that means for a country. So this is New Zealand. And New Zealand is a special country because half of its emissions come from agriculture. 43% of their total emissions are methane emissions. And New Zealand has around 10 million cattle and 26 million sheep, and for the population of humans of 5 million. And um, they are one of the first countries that had in place methane target, 10% by 2030, which is really relevant for them to meet the commitments in the Paris Agreement. And what we modeled here, this is just looking at methane emissions, and this is 19% reduction by 2050. So this is less ambitious than the target they have. And we use this um, because this is what Miles Allen has been promoting on his trips to New Zealand, which where he's basically saying, if New Zealand reduces their emissions by 90% by 2050, Miles Allen, for those of you who don't know, he's the inventor of GWP Star, then New Zealand could say this, you know, they could have a brand um, climate neutral New Zealand, basically. But, and what is, this also means, right, is because you get this 10 million tons of negative emissions, you can alleviate the climate action, not just from livestock, but also from other sectors. And this is why we are concerned that, you know, adopting this metric at the country or company level could lead to greenwashing and could undermine climate action. Thank you, Nisa. Have you finished your presentation? Yes, thank you. So I'd like to move at this point uh, to Ngoni to bring us a perspective uh, from the Global South, because one of the issues, as Nusha has explained for us in her presentation, is that, you know, it leaves big historical polluters somehow come off better when they apply GWP star. But that isn't the case in countries, say, like Kenya, where you know, the industry is kind of growing, the herds of uh, livestock are growing. So can you can you share your take on this metric for us, please? 
Sure. Thank you so much, Ezo. Thank you for this opportunity. I think maybe one thing, the way I could start is, I mean, there is using GWP star at the global level is not really a, a problem. The problem really gets to when you go at to the sub uh, global level, because then you also face an issue of there's a lot of heterogeneity, right, in terms of the starting point. To use Donald's, uh, Donald's uh, example of uh, the baseline actually really does matter. So if you look at most uh, countries, I mean, some of the countries in the global south, they, for sure there is also heterogeneity in the global south. There are some with, which already have a lot of uh, livestock uh, populations as well. But you have other places where you have uh, very low livestock populations. And if you, uh, if you use GW P star at that level, I mean, you are you start kind of like penalizing people for for new new emissions. So uh, whilst in other regions you already have stabilization of of the population, so it you would it might appear as if you already have uh, carbon neutrality. But like you rightly pointed out, I mean, the history is also important. But uh, the key is here is I mean, like uh, Nicholas mentioned, I mean, really the atmosphere doesn't really care. I mean, where this methane came from. What we really need to start talking about is really what are the solutions? And I guess one of the solutions is how can we improve efficiency of uh, livestock production uh, in the global south and in, in all places to make sure that, I mean, livestock is important, not just, uh, the, I mean, it's, it's important in so many ways for economic uh, growth and also for, I mean, just for, for food, food for, for people in, in, diff in different regions. So in a place where you already have uh, limited livestock, I mean, in most governments, they, uh, there is a big push also to increase the population of livestock. But what we're trying to, what I, what I think we need to think about is how can you um, improve efficiency of even the livestock that we already have? Uh, uh, and that really gets down to things like animal health. It gets down to the feed what is the what are the animals that are there what are they what are they eating and there are different other options other technologies that are being tried to be able to reduce the emissions so i guess the challenge with uh, sometimes using gwp at the sub sub uh, global level is that in some cases it, it might end up reinforcing some of the inequalities uh, where you have some uh, countries or or, or regions where they when they have not been uh, livestock populations have not been high, but for obvious reasons, for other reasons, economic and social economic, they really need to increase um, the livestock population. So, thank you so much. Just picking up on that point about you talked about um, you know change in different quality of feedstock and how that could reduce methane emissions. Um, would the panel like to also share um, some of the things that they think uh, perhaps GWP star is causing to be neglected, like some of the changes or, or ways to bring about a methane reduction um, that they think would be useful to start either ramping up or introducing at this point, especially for kind of large industrial herds? I might start with uh, Nusha. Yes, thank you. So what we've been calling for is for companies and countries to have science-based greenhouse gas reduction target and a separate approach to methane, so specific methane reduction targets. And then within that, um, figure out some of the measures. So we have countries in the global north that are over-consuming meat and dairy products by a lot. And those countries also have very significant share of their methane emissions come from livestock. So uh, I would also add that, you know, in those countries, you would seem because it's already very livestock production is very efficient. So those technical measures have limited potential. So but the win 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 measure for both health, environment, climate would be to reduce the consumption and production of livestock products. And this would be then something that also enables countries to switch to better production systems like agroecology, reduce the use of pesticides and all these other things that we need to do. In, um, in other countries, then potentially there may be other solutions available, but maybe uh, Ngoni would be better uh, 
speaker to address that. I just want to say that for companies, like we have now seen that some of them are moving towards methane reporting, um, but we need um, we need them also to set ambitious targets and we need them to invest. Um, the 10 dairy and five meat companies that we have analyzed in this Emissions Impossible report, they have higher methane emissions than all three sectors in the Russian Federation but they also have the combined revenue that is similar to the GDP of Norway. And they're not really investing much of their revenues and profits into emissions reductions. And this is something that is really key and crucial, not just for the climate and the living system, but also for their bottom line, because they are also dependent on safe climate, on um, for their production, right? And the science is clear, if there is not climate mitigation actions, we, it will become much more difficult to produce meat and dairy. Thank you. And um, Nicholas, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think that's that's very well said by, by Nusha. I think we need clear science-based targets from independent climate scientists working together to um, you know, qualify these these targets and uh, and measurements over time. Um, ultimately, I, I think to mitigate methane emissions, um, we need to look at the biggest source of human caused methane emissions, which comes from uh, farmed ruminants, food in particular. Um, and I mean, there's there's been multiple multiple uh, studies and evidence showing what would happen if we can uh, shift to more of a plant-based food system. Uh, we're talking freeing up uh, at least 3 billion hectares of land, uh, restoring biodiversity, uh, bringing down carbon drawdown equivalent to uh, up to 16 years of current fossil fuel emissions uh, by a study from Matthew Hayek. Um, and ultimately we're at a point where like, you know, we're the, the Western type of diet is kind of being exported, this high meat consumption type diet, like in the United States. Um, and ultimately, we don't have uh, enough land to support this without mass deforestation. So looking at these wider implications are important, while also knowing that this will be our best chance of reducing methane uh, as well and avoiding these kind of uh, very dangerous uh, climate feedback loops that we could face. Um, and, you know, of course, there's regional differences to all this. I think the onus absolutely should be on the rich countries that have contributed the most to these impacts. Um, and we should be looking at equity and justice for um, everyone around the world to have access to healthy, diverse uh, food sources. Uh, but certainly, yeah, focusing on rich countries, shifting more away from the highest methane emitting foods um, seems to me is a clear win-win. Thanks. And Donald, did you want to add anything? Um, oh, you're muted. I, I studied uh, the effect of, of an alignment of um, others, an alignment of Europe's uh, agri-food system to uh, public uh, health guidelines uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, the eff I can only underscore what Nicholas has said. The effect of an alignment with existing public health guidelines and a removal of excessive consumption of meat and dairy from the uh, food system the agri-food system, would have huge effects in Europe. We studied Europe. Huge effects. It would reduce the demand, for instance, of for soya bean by 75%, just that alone. Um, and it, it releases, it opens up opportunities for society to make decisions with land that, which and these decisions are not available at the moment. Ireland, my own country, for instance, the, uh, the uplands of Ireland are treeless and biodiversity less as well in many respects. We have to look at this as an agri-food system. Um, the other thing I would say, going back to GWP star, it's, it's not a metric. We should be clear, it's not a global warming metric. Uh, and it, it, it is useful for adding um, tone or uh, adding to uh, to the studies based on GWP 100 of, of where we're going in terms of climate, uh, climate change. It's useful at the global level. I think the experts have to come out and say, this is a tool for using at the global level only in a public policy context.
Thank you. So I think also Donald there makes the other point that livestock emissions cause other harms. You know, it isn't just a question of methane. It's also a question yeah. of biodiversity, biodiversity loss. And there's also a nitrous oxide, which is you know, also not covered by by using that metric. And Goni, uh, may, may I add just sorry oh, yes. to interrupt. Apologies. May I add that what, what we the debate about this in until now is characterized by a false dichotomy. You either eat 100 kilograms of, of meat per year or you are a vegan. What is what is really going to deliver uh, a change is moderation and alignment with public health dietary guidelines. Thank you. I'm, and Ngoni, unless you wanted to add anything to uh, the kind of solutions question, I know you touched on it in your answer. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the, the key thing, I mean, is for sure any metric or anything that we use uh, to quantify, uh, I mean, to look at the global warming potential of methane, I mean, it really has to consider also the social, economic and other considerations, right? I mean, uh, livestock is very important for, for people, it's, um, for their livelihoods, right? And uh, I know that there are a lot of efforts globally happening. I know that the global methane platform, there is a lot of investments also in uh, uh, trying to reduce, find ways to reduce uh, emissions. And I think that is the, the right direction we need to go. And also consider that, I mean, be sensitive to some of these, uh, this is also a source of, of livelihoods for other communities. So uh, some of the work that we've done, for instance, in terms of ways of uh, reducing emissions will be things like looking at rotational grazing, I mean, I mean, methane is, I mean, the science is, is very clear, right? It's an issue of uh, the the rumen, the digestibility of feed. I mean, you don't want it to stay so long in the in the rumen. And so there are, there are options and that are being tried and uh, tested. And we really need to invest in in some of some of these uh, uh, solutions. And some of the things that you can you can do in the global south are really focusing on maybe kind of like simple solutions like keeping the animal healthy, right? And making sure that um, it's, it uh, is productive, right? It's a productive animal and gets to market weight as, as quickly as possible, right? And uh, so, so there are there are things that we can do and we need to invest in. There are the kind of like blue sky ideas. People are talking about vaccinating the animals. There are also uh, things of, uh, being talked about, about sea, using seaweed, which could potentially work only in confined animals. And there are different other, other options that have been tested. Some of them have been tested in laboratories. Some things work in the lab, but um, uh, in the lab scale, but don't work in the, the animal scale. So, so we really, but we really need uh, uh, more brains, more investments in uh, developing solutions that could practically work in, uh, in the different regions. Thank you. I'm actually going to take a question now um, it's from Rachel Humphrey, and she asks, um, are you aware of any policymakers or decision makers that are seriously considering using this metric? Uh, this change would need to be adopted by the IPCC to impact national emissions, um, which seems like a big task for proponents of GWP star. Um, Nusha answered that, but I think it's an important question to kind of expand on. Because I, I've also seen like at uh, that beef, big producer countries like uh, Argentina and others have been lobbying for the adoption of GWP star by the UN IPCC. And more and more you hear it where um, people are, companies are explaining certain, they've made various calculations and models and they say at the end of it, we... Um, we've used GWP star and similarly at um, DSMOG when we go to the UK government for comment on pieces about livestock they will give us their emission scenarios and at the end of it which are kind of really quite positive and at the end of it they'll say we've used GWP star so I think whether it was designed to be used on a Kind of on a sort of global scale, which as I understand it, it was, it's already being used by countries and also by individual companies and by individual projects. So yes, there is a big sort of lobbying effort for this to be adopted more widely. Um, 
Nusha, did you want to uh, add to that at all? Yeah, I mean, I can just say a little bit what we've discovered in our report. So we have lobby groups like the National Cattlemen Beef Association saying this is the methodology everyone should be using. International Dairy Federation was making the case for GWP Star at COP27. And um, NFU adopted it. Um, and then we have this other attempt. So the letter to IPCC that I mentioned that was, you know, signed, co-signed by several farm lobby groups. And, you know, even though as Hayden is saying, IPCC doesn't adopt metrics, but, you know, they really wanted to have it mentioned there. And then once it's mentioned, you know, they interpret this mention in a little bit different way than to what it actually is. We've seen evidence of that. And in the end of the day, you know, I think maybe the the end game is not even to have it adopted because we know that this will be very difficult, but it is to kind of sow doubt over the it's, science of methane. It's creating and, confusion. Yeah, exactly. And we know that, you know, many policymakers, especially those that are MEPs or MPs, are not you know, scientists, they're not topic experts. So if they get lobby groups coming to them saying like, well, methane is not a problem because we have this new metric, which is what they are actually saying, that can already undermine policy action and it can undermine, you know, this really, really important measure that we have at our disposal to prevent, you know, out of control global warming. Thank you. Okay. But may I underscore the 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 politic the the dem democratic side of this? Uh, political decisions are made by policymakers, uh, or policymakers make make decisions uh, on behalf of polit politicians, based on 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 p political considerations of how their stakeholder communities, uh, including voters, um, are thinking. And if there is confusion among in these communi communities, including society as a whole, uh, such as the confusion that uh, methane has only only uh, ha affects climate to an ex extent which is only one quarter of that which we have until now thought it to be. It's only a one quarter of the. Da it does one quarter of the damage. Now we understand that's what we're being told compared with what, what we were being told some years ago. This sort of confusion, how are people supposed to handle it? You, need, you know, it, it took me and Casper several w months to unravel the evidence that we analyzed and come to our, our understanding of it. You can't expect policymakers and especially politicians to uh, identify the nuances of what is being said that means that the responsibility is on the scientists to be very clear, to be very clear about what they're saying uh, and not to be avoiding certain words that are important or using other words which are misleading. And I think there needs to be a separation of competence or authority between the making of tools and the use of tools. And what has happened is the makers of some of these tools have got involved in the communities who see an advantage in using those tools. Thank you, Donald. I'm going to take another question, um, which is a fairly technical one, but I think, you know, this is a technical subject. So for those, this might be one for you, Nicholas, or for you again, Donald, which is... Um, Casper is there, by the way. Casper, hello. Do you have a, would you like to unmute? Um, perhaps to Casper, if you put your message to me um, in the comment in the chat. Um, there's a question here from Tusha, and they say, um, in reality, do we need to measure both absolute emissions and the yearly change in emissions warming a pact of methane? So this is a sense that is it a question that it's not about just using WP star or GWP 100. It's about how you use them together. Yes. Is, is that what we're suggesting? Yes. Uh, Nicholas, do you want to take that first and then Donald? 
Yeah, figure eight in our report uh, actually, I think, um, made this uh, quite clear. Like, we need to be looking at uh, both these things. And that's what uh, GWP 100, GWP 20, if used um, appropriately, can can do. It, it won't allow these highest emitters right now to escape uh, even basic climate accountability. So, yeah, we need to be looking at the absolute emissions, uh, how much emissions to date. Uh, uh, we can't assume, like what I mentioned at the very start of this, we can't assume that our current level, which is uh, over 250% above pre-industrial levels, is an acceptable baseline for methane. So we ultimately need to decrease that. And um, just looking at warming over time is not a, um, a great way of doing that because it... Um, it has a host of issues and uh, and doesn't uh, hold the biggest uh, emitters accountable. Yeah. You mean further warming over time? Yes. Yeah. This is where the word further is so important. Muted. I wanted to bring in a comment here from uh, Sparsha Saha, who says... Um, it sounds like focusing on the rate of change completely ignores equity. Yeah. What is the best way to get clear scientific consensus around this? Or would you say this already exists? Now, my feeling is the, the principle of common but differentiated responsibility is well established when it comes to energy and fossil fuels. But I feel that is not yet established in the same way when it comes to livestock emissions. And Goni, would you like to comment on, on that question, please? Yeah, yeah. I think I mean it's I think it's in like I mentioned in the earlier, I mean it's important for sure. There are some I mean, whatever we do, some communities would really have to increase their livestock population. Uh, because I mean, for obvious reasons, they st they still need to be able to to survive, right? And to live. I mean, life livestock has another other important roles uh, that it plays. So in some in some region for sure there is need to to maybe reduce uh, meat consumption and reduce the demand side and then consequently reduce the supply side. So, and we also need to also look at historical emissions. Some of these places that have low livestock populations also have had historically low uh, impacts on uh, on gas emissions. So, so we, we I think we really need to the scientific community really need to work on finding better ways of uh, capturing all this heterogeneity and this uh, diversity. I think uh, kind of like blanket uh, approaches might not be really helpful in this uh, discussion because they, they could also cause uh, bottlenecks in uh, in getting consensus at the global level. So, so I think we really need, uh, sometimes we have to be careful about averages, right? I mean, sometimes a lot of a lot is hidden in the averages, and um, uh, a lot of uh, injustices. Okay, so I think we need to think long and hard and find ways of capturing some of these um, heterogeneities as well. Thank you, uh, Nusha. Would you have anything to comment on equity and common and differentiated responsibility when it comes to methane? I mean, I don't have much to add. Like this issue has been in the scientific literature as well. And this issue has been highlighted that, you know, the historical countries, companies that have been producing a lot of livestock are actually rewarded with this metric and they can present small reductions as big impacts. And, um, and you know, this is, a question of uh, justice, climate justice as well. Thank you. I've got a question and I'll play, I'll play a sort of devil's advocate here, which is to ask the panel, what do you say when um, there are you know, food and farming, you know, the big political issue at the moment, there are farmers you know, protesting and they say, why are, you know, 30% of emissions is from agriculture? Yes. But why aren't you focusing on, you know, fossil fuels and energy who produce, you know, the vast majority um, of emissions? Do you, can, do you have any response to, to that criticism that we're hearing uh, more from farmers? 
happy to take this one because we are, you know, like there's a much more attention and resources going towards fighting emissions reductions in the energy and transport sectors. And you can see the results. So the emissions in energy and transport sectors have been reducing. And you cannot say the same for agriculture. Like the baseline for agriculture methane is also increase. And if you look at European Union, um, you know, the reductions, livestock methane represents 53% of total methane emissions and is expected to go down by two to three percent. So that is nothing. And EU is not on track to meet its commitment in the global methane pledge if they do not put additional measures in place. So um, I think it's, you know, it's unfair to claim that there's no action on fossil fuels, but the problem is we need to do both. Like most conventional science says you cannot reach 1.5 degree temperature increase unless you achieve reductions of emissions, overall emissions from farming, especially from animal agriculture, but then also at least 25% reduction in agriculture methane emissions. And the FAO report that was launched at COP last year is actually the one that confirmed this again. One of the peculiarities that we noticed, Hazel, if, if you don't mind, can I uh, add to that? Um, one of the peculiarities of the papers that we analyzed in our paper is that uh, the, the literature was saying that the use of GWP star will increase emphasis on methane emissions. That's true at the global level. But when it's applied at business level, what you find is, is that uh, there's an increased emphasis on methane so as to hide the effect of ongoing carbon dioxide emissions from energy. So you, you, coming back to the GWP star story, uh, it can be used to de-emphasize carbon mitigation uh, or carbon dioxide mitigation uh, by hiding it behind a temporary reduction in warming within a business, within a business or a country or uh, a product. Um, and that's the danger, another uh, aspect of the danger of using GWP star at the sub-global level. It, it can actually increase emphasis on methane mitigation, reduce emphasis on carbon dioxide mitigation from energy. Another aspect is that when I analyze some of the statements of, of some scientists recently, there is a hint in them in what they're saying. Is it do, emissions do not matter from any source. What matters is warming. This is the trading off of Article 2 against Article 4. What matters is warming. Don't worry about... The, we are not the emissions are only causing driving it so don't worry about the emissions just look at the warming effect and that is opening up the door to some fossil fuel companies actually in the analogy in our paper where they use a reduction in methane leakage to hide to to offset the consequences of the burning of natural gas by by consumers the conversion of natural gas into carbon dioxide uh, so so there, there is this GWP star story is not just about methane. It's about any situation where there's a mix of temporary and long-term gases. Methane in agriculture, I mean. Thank you. I've got, did any other panelists want to add to that? Or if... Nick, just Nick? just one quick comment on that. I mean, I think these things can get quite complicated. I think ultimately we absolutely know that methane re reductions today will see atmospheric effects very, very quickly. Yeah. So any any sort of me uh, metric or, or tactic or model that attempts to escape that is attempting to escape accountability of the emission reductions of all sources we need. And it's not an either or thing. We need to address fossil fuels as well. Um, so I, th I think ultimately this is what we're, we're showing in uh, our, our respective reports and this webinar is that we, we need accountability for the highest polluters today. Methane is one of the best kind of levers we can pull to um, reduce our, our risk of climate feedbacks in the near term. So um, yeah, this is kind of what we all need to kind of keep as a, as a, a background to all these different efforts we're doing. 
Thank you. I think you nearly you accidentally summed up there for me. That was great. Yes. Um, I did have a question, just as a point of clarification, while I've got you here, Sparsha asks, does GWP star GWP star gives a more accurate assessment of the warming impacts of methane over time? Is an accuracy tweak to this a more accurate assessment of further warming on mm -hmm. over yes. time? Yes. To make sure I'm fully getting this. My understanding is yes. Yes. Can you confirm that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. She understands. Really. I say yeah. She, there you go. Marcia, I'm assuming that's a she. I don't know. <laughs> um. Okay. So I mean, I think pretty much we've wrapped up. I'm not seeing any um new questions here. Let me just take one last look in the question. Oh, yes, we've got some new questions just come in from anonymous attendee, but we can just uh, quickly two minutes before we wrap up. And the question is, how does this work impact carbon offset schemes? Now, I know this isn't, um, I mean, I, well, I'll let the panel answer. My understanding is that, you know, this is a, a different issue, but I think the two are connected. Uh, Nusa, would you like to come in on that and then maybe Ngoni? I mean, I think it's a different issue, but it is possible if your carbon offset schemes are around methane reductions and if you're, you're using GWP star, you might get much higher savings. And that might potentially, you know, make those schemes more attractive. But on the other hand, it might kind of give us unrealistic picture of emissions reductions, I would say. I think that's perhaps what the two um, have in common, carbon offsets and uh, GWP star, is that they might give unrealistic uh, impressions of what can be saved. And Goni, I'm going to ask you just because I know uh, while we were in Dubai, there were um, there was an initiative just published just before, I think, of the UAE, I think it was, that had bought up vast tracts of, I believe, your um, homeland of Zimbabwe and also parts of East Africa in order to like offset emissions so um i don't know if you have a view on offsets oh uh, yeah yeah i guess um i think the i mean offsets really the if you think about it right it's you are offsetting something that is you are there's no positive benefit from a mitigation perspective right uh if you are you're offsetting an emission that has happened right but what we that is not the direction we, we really want to go i mean for sure i i the benefit of that is that the, then you get uh, carbon finance that moves, that incentivizes people to change uh, behaviors. But the direction we really want to, to go is uh, to reduce emissions, right? Uh, not that somebody else has to emit somewhere else and then someone else offsets. So I think the direction we need to go is really reducing emissions, which, uh, and uh, to answer your question about, um, about, the, about the farmers really is, we all have to kind of like play a part. I mean, as you can see, what is happening to the to the climate, the warming, and all, we really have to all play a part if we can. And the small, if we, we if everybody does a small bit, then uh, we we make progress in in that direction. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, that remains for me to say thank you to our panel for helping us explore this you know complex and technical issues with big you know implications for justice and climate and thank you for our lively debates which have been going on uh, in the chat and on comments thank you everyone for your input i think you know if we wrap up we can say the lessons to take away here is that gwp star while accurate shouldn't be used um, in isolation because it can be misleading and there's a risk that will incentivize a lack of cutting methane and a lack of climate action instead of the reverse um, that it's open to misuse and the danger, as it will, penalise new and growing sources of emissions. So we've got a sense of, you know, the risks that it poses. And also we can end on Ngoni's notes that, you know, we need to cut emissions as fast as we can. And any metric that distracts us from that is not one that should be widely used. So... On that note, that brings us to five. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, please do look up the um, papers at your leisure um, from the chat. We'll leave this open for slightly longer so you can make sure you collect all those uh, references and links. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hazel. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hazel, thank you so much. Thank you.